Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas. Hello again, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. I'm Steve Barnes, and we continue Debate Week here on Arkansas PBS. At this hour, the race for Congress in Arkansas's 3rd District. The candidates in alphabetical order, Michael Collegius, the Libertarian nominee, Celeste Williams, the Democratic nominee, and U.S. Representative Steve Womack, the Republican nominee, and the incumbent. The candidates will be questioned by a panel of Arkansas journalists, Doug Thompson of the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Una Lee of KHBS KHOG, and Randall Seiler of The Courier. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Each will have two minutes to respond to a question. Rebuttals are limited to one minute. And, of course, each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. Now, the debate sequence was determined by a drawing in which the candidates or their representatives participated. And our timekeeper tonight is Cindy Gamble of Arkansas PBS. As we begin, we note that we have followed all protocols for the COVID-19 era, especially distancing and masking. Our masks were removed only moments ago. And with that, our first opening statement is from Ms. Williams. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panel, Arkansas PBS, and those of you at home for taking the time to become better informed before you cast your vote. I am not the traditional candidate you're used to seeing here on the debate stage. I've been a nurse for more than 20 years. I am a wife and a working mother of four. People are frustrated by their elected officials who spend their time sowing, telling us who to fear, fighting one another, and sowing national discord rather than solving the problems of everyday Americans. We are facing a national public health crisis and economic crisis as well. Willful ignorance is not what American exceptionalism is all about, and it isn't patriotic. Truth and science are neither liberal nor conservative. We need leaders who will create a roadmap to a better future, a future where none of us go broke because we get sick, where we have world-class educational opportunities from preschool to vocational school to college. And we restore the dignity of work by ensuring all workers in America are paid a fair wage. And we honor our promises made to seniors by protecting Medicare and Social Security. Taxpayer money should, be, should benefit all taxpayers not just the extremely wealthy or corporate donors. We need an advocate in Washington who will govern in a fair manner and fight for all of us in the 3rd Congressional District. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Womack. Thank you very much, Steve, uh, for the opportunity to Arkansas PBS uh, for this forum to be able to discuss and discern the differences between the various candidates uh, seeking public office, not just in this particular race, but in the other races that have been chronicled here in uh, recent debates. I want to thank uh, Randall, Yuna, and, and Doug also for their participation here. And, and look, I, I'm going to tell you straight up that I appreciate the fact that Celeste Williams has uh, thrown her hat in the ring, her candidacy, if you will, uh, to represent the voters in the 3rd District. Michael Collegius, who is uh, been up here before, but uh, again, thanks to him for his willingness to serve the people of the 3rd District. I, I've been in Congress now for the better part of 10 years. I have a front row seat to many of the issues, all of the issues that face our country, but also have a unique uh, perspective on the issues that are specific 
to the third district of Arkansas, and I'll talk more about those a little bit later on. But we're at a crossroads in this country. There is no doubt that this particular election, though we say it every four years, may be the most important election in our lifetime. I believe that is a statement that is true uh, in, in this particular case, more so than maybe ever before, certainly in modern history, because our country is, is going to have to make a decision between the direction that it's going to take. Is it going to be a government that is going to be government-centric, that's going to be uh, too large, uh, take too much of your tax money, that's going to expand government programs to the extent that we pile on more debt than what we've already accumulated for our, ch our children and our grandchildren? Or is it going to be a government that for 240 plus years have served this country very well? A, gum, a, a limited government, a government that pushes as many of these issues down to the states as possible, a government that believes in the rule of law, personal accountability, personal responsibility. Those are the ideals that I fight for every day in Washington, and I'm looking forward to two more years to do just that same thing. Well, Mr. Wilmack, thank you. Mr. Collegius. I also want to thank AETN for inviting us all out here today and for hosting this debate. My name is Michael Collegius. I'm your Libertarian candidate for U.S. Congress. I'm a retired school teacher. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. I've served on the board of directors for a multi-million dollar nonprofit. And I currently serve my community as a volunteer firefighter. I am a product of the American dream. It's the American dream that our government is increasingly making harder and harder to achieve. Our nation is $27 trillion in debt. Our entire economy is only $19 trillion. The interest alone on that debt is over $300 billion every year. That's not sustainable. The moment every American is conceived, they owe a debt to the United States government of over $82,000 each. I want you to think about that. Look at your children. Think about your grandchildren. <clears throat> before they make their first mortgage payment, before they buy their first car, get their first job, take that first student loan, before their first day in school, their first steps, or even their first breath, they are already $80,000 in debt. We need to fix that. <clears throat> we need to fix that by voting differently. If we don't fix that, we're going to run out of money to treat any of the other problems. There won't be anything left for education. There won't be anything left for Medicare or any kind of health care or to save Social Security. There won't be enough left for our national defense. We need to change that by voting differently. We can do that this November. Please join me in doing so. It hasn't mattered whether we've elected Democrats or whether Republicans have been in power. The result has been the same bad government. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. Stop the insanity. Vote Libertarian with me. Thank you, sir. Doug Thompson has our first question tonight, and it goes initially to Mr. Womack. Congressman, there's no need to go back over the grim statistics of the pandemic. We've all been living this for eight months now, and to some extent, we're all in the same boat. But the people who have borne the brunt of this from the beginning and are still bearing the brunt of it are the essential workers and the families they go home to. And even among them, the people, the point of the spear, so to speak, are minorities who disproportionately make up the number of essential workers. If you're black or Hispanic, you have a three or four times as great a chance of contracting this disease as a white, white person. The worst case I know of is the Marshallese in uh, Northwest Arkansas who represent about 3% of the population of Benton and Washington counties and at one point accounted for one half of the deaths in those counties. Why were these essential people in underprotected communities left so vulnerable and what should be done about it? Well, Doug, you speak of the, uh, the issue that grips, as you know, the in entire country and uh, not just our uh, beautiful third district of Arkansas and indeed uh, the minority communities that, that you speak of. Look, this pandemic um, hit our shores and did not come with a playbook. 
Uh, and in many respects, our country was caught somewhat unprepared in terms of, you know, the personal protective equipment that I'm sure uh, my nurse opponent down here will speak to here briefly, um, but also in terms of, uh, of preparing ourselves for the potential economic calamity that would ensue this particular uh, pandemic. Um, and there, there are very difficult decisions that have to be made many times on the fly as you're trying to deal with uh, something as unknown as COVID-19. Uh, and and I th look, I think our, our Marshallese community and uh, maybe to a bit lesser extent, but not too much of a lesser extent, uh, the Latino community and others uh, in our society uh, just basically uh, were affected in, in such a way that uh, the particular cultures that we all come from uh, probably reared its ugly head, you know, and in a lot of the cases in the, in the minority communities, you have cultures that live in very close proximity to one another, in some cases, many families to a, a given home. And so the ability to socially distance and to be able to create separation from one another is made difficult. Some of the workplaces in which a lot of our minority communities happen to work uh, make it difficult to socially distance and and it took us a while to be able to get the best management practices in place and the proper protections installed to ensure that they do not you know, you know infect one another uh, but again we are still trying to find our way through this pandemic and trying to find the sweet spot that 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 very difficult and elusive place where we can keep our economy moving and at the same time provide for the public safety of our people. All right, Mr. Womack, thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, certainly COVID has disproportionately affected our neighbors who are people of color. Um, there's no mystery as to why that occurs. Anybody who works in healthcare understands that those social determinants of health are what affect a person's overall um, ability to be healthy and live a productive life. And those are things like having educational and economic opportunities, a good paying job, benefits that allow you to get health care. And so when we see communities that are disproportionately harmed by that, that is of course why. So I would like to say that there was a playbook actually left by the Obama administration and the Trump administration disbanded our pandemic preparedness team. So in hindsight, that was a really bad decision. No one who works in healthcare thinks that this is an acceptable outcome of where we are right now. The United States has unmatched manufacturing capabilities. We have unmatched biotech, um, companies, we have a tremendous amount of intellectual resources that are housed in the CDC and NIH that have been undercut by the Trump administration, who, you know, we all are suffering in this time of pandemic. And we needed leadership to bring us all together to defeat this common enemy. And we haven't gotten that. And we are we are dying in a lack of leadership in this country right now. It's not two different choices between economy and health. We have to tackle both, and there's no improvement in our economy until we address the pandemic. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Kalagius. Yeah, the least privileged among us always bear the brunt of bad policy. Um, it, it's been that way throughout, throughout history, and it's happened here again. Um, the pandemic caught us flat-footed, not because we had one bad president or two, but because we have had decades and decades of bad policy that goes back to not just presidents, but our Congresses that pass all these laws. We have certificates of needs laws that make it illegal to have adequate supplies to address a pandemic. The reason there aren't enough respirators, the reason there isn't enough PPE equipment, the reason there aren't enough doctors or enough hospitals isn't because President Trump dismissed the pandemic team. It's not because there was a lack of leadership. It's because we have laws that prevented us from doing that. We got bad data. You cannot make good decisions on bad data. 
the reason we had bad data is because there was no way to collect good data. The FDA and the CDC have restrictions that made it impossible for our industry, which is very capable, to provide any of those tests that we needed to get that data. We had companies that had tests ready to go. They knew that this was coming. They'd seen it in Asia. They had already prepared these tests for Europe, and they were not allowed to distribute or use them. Not in this country. The CDC wouldn't allow it. The FDA wouldn't approve it until the CDC finally came out with their own tests and found out that they did not work. By then, it was too late. We were acting on bad data. Even the data we do collect can't always be trusted. We've politicized everything left and right so that now we don't even know what numbers we can believe. It depends on who's reporting the numbers and how they interpret them. This pandemic may have caused as little as 2,000 deaths or more than 200,000, but we can't trust the data because depending on who's telling the story, depending on who's interpreting the numbers and how they're doing it, the numbers are wildly different and wildly inaccurate. Until we can change that, until we can stop this left-right divide, until we can get the government out of the way so that the people that have skills and knowledge can actually do their jobs, we will not see any improvements. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, back to you for a one-minute rebuttal. Well, only to say that it's very easy to, uh, to armchair quarterback the pandemic and be able to throw a lot of criticism toward the president's way. Look, the president was handed a, a bad situation to begin with, and I, I don't believe there was a playbook that came with this pandemic because nobody on the other side has offered up anything other than more testing, more contact, tracing, those kinds of things, which seems to be out of the uh, decisions made by the coronavirus task force led by Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, but I will say this about the funding of the institutions that support America's response to the pandemic. If you go back in time and look over the last, well, I know for the 10 years that I've been in Congress and for a while, as some of you know, I served on the Labor, Health and Human Services Subcommittee of Appropriations for two different terms. We threw more money at the National Institutes of Health, billions of dollars more year over year, and more money at the Centers for Disease Control year over year. So I don't think it's about resources. I just think it's about the fact that we were misled as a country going in as to the origination of the uh, coronavirus and had to play catch up from then on. And now I finally, I think that we have finally at least began to make inroads into the best practices that help protect us against the pandemic. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lee has our next question and that goes first to Ms. Williams. All right, and Ms. Williams, there are businesses and in industries turning to the federal government for financial assistance during the pandemic. From restaurants to airlines, millions of people are being laid off. And just last week, airline companies started cutting 35,000 employees after their $25 billion bailout expired. So now they're asking for more money. How do you prioritize who gets federal dollars and who doesn't? So my bias is always to make sure that we are putting money into the hands of the everyday citizen. I think we need to make sure that we are not just bailing out cruise lines and airline industries, but making sure that we are reinvesting taxpayer money into the actual taxpayers and make sure that those who are out of work for no fault of their own are able to keep a roof over their head and feed their children. And so I certainly support additional stimulus, especially for those who are out of work and to make sure that people are able to meet their basic needs when there's not another job that they can go get right now when we have record unemployment. And then I think from there, we need to make sure that we're actually addressing the pandemic, that we have a national strategy in place so that we can make sure that we are testing, tracing, and isolating appropriately. And certainly we all have to model appropriate behavior. I certainly have been concerned of how many people in Washington have gotten the coronavirus simply from not following the recommendations of experts. Masks, hand washing, those things work. My husband who is an emergency room nurse actually contracted the coronavirus several weeks back and we immediately isolated and socially distanced and no one else in my family got sick. Yet we look at the White House and so many people have gotten sick that I'm quite concerned that that's actually 
a huge national security risk. And we need to make sure that we are protecting our frontline workers, our essential workers, and make sure that we're reinvesting money so that they can get the PPE that they need and we can all be protected. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Kalagias. Yeah, financial assistance for those that have been harmed is going to be hard to do because there are no reserves of cash in the U.S. government. As I've mentioned before, we're $27 trillion in debt. We don't have any money to give any financial assistance to anybody. So any money that the government gives, it has to take from someone else. And in this case, we're stealing it from future generations, from our grandkids. So any financial assistance that we give out now, realize will have to be paid back with interest by our future generations. And that's the problem with having generational deficits on increasing debt year after year after year is that when something like this comes along, we no longer have the resources that we would need to be able to deal with it. That's, that's the problem with having irresponsible leadership in government when we should have servanthood. So it is very difficult to deal with this. The government has created, because they had bad information, created bad policy. It's caused record high unemployment. It has caused terrible things to happen to the economy. Worldwide, the economy has gone down because we are the world's economic leader. So, and probably the economic damage will cause more health problems, more deaths among the world's population than the pandemic itself did. That's why we need to have changes in government. We need people that will make better decisions so that we can make good decisions based on good data instead of having to try and scramble to make up for and deal with the bad decisions we've made in the past. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, the, the, the first thing you, you don't do is that you don't continue to double down on flawed policies that are not targeted and very transparent and temporary. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, knowing that we were facing a very uncertain future, uh, the Congress of the United States, and I voted for it, uh, put together a several trillion dollar program called the CARES package. Now this is after the original eight billion that went in initially and then the family's first package, but that the big one, the CARES package, uh, which, which put some money into some programs that um, quite frankly, uh, put a moral dilemma on a lot of workers in our country because we were guaranteeing them $600 a week of additional income uh, un, un, under unemployment, in, un, unemployment insurance, which was uh, markedly more money than a lot of these folks were making to even work. And at the same time, we have job creators and business owners trying to get back to work and, and at least get some semblance of, of economic activity going in their business. They had workers that wouldn't come back to work because the government had created a policy that made it more lucrative for them to sit at home. That is a terrible moral dilemma and a government policy should never put its workers under a moral dilemma like that. The other policy was, uh, th that is absent in this whole discussion is when a business does get ready to come back to work, what can we do to give them certain liability protections so that if they're using the best known guidance from the CDC, best management practices known to the industry, that they can bring their people back and not fear the bevy of lawsuits that are sure to come if somebody were to get infected on the line. Those are the things that we could be doing right now to soften the blow of COVID as far as additional stimulus and those kinds of things, as, as Mike has said. I mean, we are 27 trillion in debt and this money will have to be paid back. So it does have to be targeted. It needs to be temporary and it's gotta be completely transparent. That's two Thank minutes. You. Thanks, Mr. Womack. Ms. Williams, one minute. Thank you so much. You know, if a worker says that they do not want to return to work, then they actually lose that unemployment um, insurance. So that, that's not really a thing that occurs. You know, that um, we do need to protect our essential workers. As an example, when my husband was um, off work for being sick, he was offered um, workers' compensation. So his check was one third of the amount of his normal paycheck. And during that time, my mortgage did not go down to a third of what it was. My kids did not suddenly quit eating as much and only consume a third of their normal food. We do need to make sure that we are prepared 
to support our essential workers. And the way that we do that is we utilize our tax money for actual taxpayers and we don't cut taxes during economic times of good. Randall Seiler has our next question and it goes first to Mr. Kalagias. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, the uh, Senate right now is trying to seat a Supreme Court nominee and trying to get that done by the end of the year. Uh, do you agree with this approach uh, towards seating a uh, nominee in the election year at the tail end of the year like this? That's, you know, as you said, that's the Senate and not the House, so it's kind of outside our, our sphere of influence, but, but I'll, t I'll take the question. And I, I think Merrick Garland deserved his day uh, when he was appointed by Obama in the last administration. That's the Senate's job. Their job is to advise and issue consent when the president makes a, a nominee. President Obama made his nominee. The Senate should have done its job and advised and consented. It did not. This time, they've decided they've done it. It's, it's party politics. I recognize that. So it's, it's right versus left, and it, it's creating more of a mess, which is why we need to get rid of that right versus left paradigm. So, but yes, I do believe that the current nominee deserves her day in front of the Senate. She deserves her chance to, to be nominated to the court. Um, it's up to the Senate to do their advice and consent, which, which they are doing now. Um, but I think that there are a whole lot of senators that should have been thrown out of office for not doing their job at the end of the Obama administration. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, as Mike said, this is not in our lane. Uh, I can only speak maybe from the perspective of, uh, of a taxpayer. And, uh, and, and I will tell you that, you know, senators are elected for a certain amount of time. Presidents are elected for a certain amount of time. Um, the, the, the vacancies that could occur on the Supreme Court are not confined to the first three years of a presidency or in the first two or three years of a, of a Senate senator's tenure. Uh, they happen at any time. And unfortunately, with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we have seen the need for a, a, at least a vacancy on the court and the need to fill that vacancy. The Senate, uh, uh, the president has done his job uh, to tell the president that he shouldn't appoint somebody is telling him not to execute his Article II powers. He has that constitutional authority and I believe the constitutional mandate to nominate. Now, the Senate is a totally different area. I mean, as, as Mike said, advise and consent. It's their job uh, to, they're not required to hold hearings, but in my opinion, should hold hearings, have a full vetting of the candidate, uh, and then take an up or down vote. Uh, the reason it's going to happen this year is because elections have consequences. The Senate is in the hands of the GOP and the presidency is in the hands of the GOP, unlike it was four years ago when, when we had this first round. Uh, so, I, you know, I believe the president should nominate as he has done. I believe the Senate should hear from the, the witness and take the up or down vote, which I believe they will do. And I believe that Amy Coney Barrett will be seated as the ninth justice on the Supreme Court. And nobody should complain about it because it is within the constitutional authority that we all up, swear to uphold when we take the oath. It's within the constitutional authority of the two bodies. Mr. Womack, thank you. Ms. Williams, two minutes. Thank you so much. I also agree that this is more of a Senate issue than a House issue. And certainly I was disheartened that Merrick Garden, Garland did not get a Senate hearing. And I think that was an unfortunate precedent that was set at that time. And now we've ratcheted up the political temperature on this issue and really politicized the courts. And I think the more important question is, what do we do about it and where do we go from here? You know, I've seen some interesting proposals um, from some of the Congress, uh, Congressman Rokana who has suggested term limit limits for the Supreme Court justices so that each president would then get two um, Supreme Court justices to nominate and take that pressure off those political battles. And really we need to make sure that we are investing in a functional democracy. And so I understand that that would likely cause a um, debate where it would have to be a constitutional amendment but I think we really need to look at how do we turn the temperature down? How do we stop screaming at each other from one side of the aisle to the other? And we need to really work together to be able to make, 
to just reduce the temperature of that so that each person can, the president is supposed to be able to nominate a Supreme Court justice. And so he obviously has that right. But people are scared because they worry that their health care is on the line and they're looking at the court decisions that may be upcoming that will be before the Supreme Court. Mr. Kalagias, one minute rebuttal. I, I, I think this issue illustrates one thing probably better than, than any other issue that we're going to have here, on, and that's the need for having third-party candidates. We have an excellent third-party candidate, a libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate this year in Ricky Harrington. If we did not have partisan politics in Congress, then these problems would go away. Merrick Garland did not get his day in the Senate because the Senate was controlled by the Republican Party. Okay. Now the Democrats are howling because the Senate still has, is still controlled by the Republican Party, and so now Trump's candidate is getting their day in court. How much better would it be if the Senate had no power in party, no, no party in power? If no party has a majority, then the people have power again. So that's the way to fix this problem. She said, what do we do about it? That's what we do about it. Start electing third party people into the Senate so that no party has power there anymore and they can start doing their job. Next question from Ms. Lee, and it goes first to Mr. Womack. Congressman, um, in an earlier interview with 4029, your challenger, Celeste Williams, told us, Congressman Womack has had 10 years in office and his biggest concern has been fiscal responsibility. Under his watch, our national deficit has ballooned, and that is in large part to the fact that we had a massive tax cut for billionaires and multinational corporations. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Okay, well, uh, look, I've, I've heard the narrative uh, from the National Democratic Party. It's a page out of their playbook, and she's reading that playbook, I'm, I'm sure as well she should. But let's just throw a couple of facts on the table. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, for the next three years, this country had record revenues. Let me say that again. After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, up until the COVID crisis, which I think we could all agree is a, is a major hurdle for our economy to overcome. Record revenues. The problem is, it's not that we tax too little. Of, of any uh, uh, socioeconomic means, it's, it's not that we tax too little, so we spend too much. And most of that spending is on the side of the ledger that is what I call on autopilot. I'm the former chairman of the budget committee. I rank on budget right now would be chairman if we were in the majority. We, we've not done a budget since the last budget that I proposed as budget chairman to be able to finally start whittling away at the programs and the waste of government and the expense of government and start finding our way onto a fiscal glide path that is sustainable. The fact is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act helped the lowest quintile of workers in America, those lowest earners, lifted out of poverty thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Remember, it almost doubled the standard deduction. It did double the child tax credit. So to say that it didn't help the, the poorer earners in our society is just a misrepresentation of the facts. And then to go a step further in the HEROES package that is held up right now by the Senate, thankfully, Nancy Pelosi's package removes the SALT cap deduction on high wage earners that pay a lot more in state and local taxes, that's in the HEROES package. So my friends on the other side speak with a little bit of forked tongue when they start talking about how Two. we want to take care of the rich, and yet they're doing that in their legislation as well. So I, I just think the numbers speak for themselves. That's two minutes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Womack. Ms. Williams, two minutes. Thank you so much. I too agree that the numbers speak for themselves. In fact, from 2016, we've had increasing deficit spending every single year. We are also now in a time where we have a record trade deficit. It is the highest of all time. We are saddling our youth with a tremendous amount of national debt that risks our national security. It means that there is less money for our safety nets and it risks programs like Social Security and Medicare. Congressman Womack did put forth a budget. I believe that a budget is a moral document that shows 
where you want to invest and what you value. And in that budget, there were cuts to both Medicare and Social Security. You know, when you look at our tax system, nobody wants to pay taxes. I think everyone must pay their fair share and not a penny more. But when we look at the top 99, or the 99% of us pay about 7.6% of our wealth. And when you compare that to the top one-tenth of the 1%, they only pay about 3.2%. And I think that's wrong. The top 50 in our nation, the most wealthy, the amount of people below, that have an economic status below them that it would take to equal their wealth is 165 million. We have rising inequality and we have to make sure that we allow every American to have a chance. Thank you. Mr. Kalagias, two minutes. Yeah, this, this question kind of takes uh, my entire closing statement away. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, both, both of the candidates have said some things that are right. Um, that, that's my issue is the national debt, and, uh, and, and yeah, he's been terrible at it. Um, in the 10 years he's been in office, it's over $12 trillion that we've added to the debt. So, but it's not like before he got into office we were doing any better. Uh, we've been pretty consistently adding to the debt every year since 1957. And he is right that we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. The problem is, is that he's also voted for all of those spending bills and he's voted to lift the, the debt cap every time it's come up for a vote. So as he mentioned, he, he was the chair of the budget committee. He sat on the budget committee. But we haven't had an actual budget get passed in the entire time he's been in office, much less a balanced one. So. I, I'm glad this question was brought up. Like I said, it's, it's the, the hard issue of my campaign. So, but I'm, I'm not in the top 1%. I'm not rich, I'm, I'm not poor. I'd say I'm probably in the top 50%. But my taxes are a whole lot more than 7.6% of my wealth. So I'm paying over 50% of my income every year in taxes. By the time you get done with my payroll taxes, by the time you get done with income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, gas taxes, food taxes, and all the other taxes that they keep adding up on us, it takes me till after July before I'm finally earning money for me. Until that point, it's all going to the government. I can't afford to pay any more. So we need to work on, on this problem. We need to balance the budget. We need to do that not by increasing our taxes, we need to do that by controlling our spending. And there's only one candidate up here that's going to be willing to do that, and that's me. Mr. Womack, one minute. Okay, well, first of all, uh, the budget that I presented in 2018 for fiscal 19 balanced in a nine-year, you have to do it within a 10-year window. We did it in a nine-year window, and, and not with gimmicks. I knew that when we presented our budget that we had to put forth a document that could actually put America on a more sustainable fiscal glide scope. And we did. Now my opponent, uh, way down at the other end, says I cut Medicare. Now I, I would yield time to her if she could explain what that Medicare cut is. She probably doesn't know because she's talking, she's using talking points. Or maybe she could explain the cuts to Social Security. Here are the facts. There were no cuts to Social Security. We just simply made a change in our budget that would make it impossible for you to collect unemployment compensation and disability at the same time. That's the only Social Security change, okay? Let's be specific. And on Medicare, very simple change. Elevate the age of eligibility from 65 to 67 to equalize it with Social Security. I will argue this, if you can't make some small to, change to I the entitlement to, program, I have to interrupt then Mr. how Womack. can you tackle the bigger issues? We're really running over, Mr. Womack. Uh, next question from Mr. Seiler goes first to Ms. Williams. Yes, ma'am. Um, we've seen unprecedented attacks on public health and clean air and water in this administration. And I was wondering what steps would you take in Congress to advance strong environmental rules, including restoring and strengthening the rules that have been rolled back? Thank you. That's a really important question. And I think that it is very important to think about 
the planet that we're going to leave for our children. So I support a revenue neutral um, carbon tax that would help us curtail that. Additionally, I think we need to think about our energy usage, where we get our energy, and really invest in the energy and the jobs of tomorrow. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, and we need to make sure that we are incentivizing clean energy. And that's not just a save the planet kind of solution, but it's also an economic opportunity. And I think that we need to then make sure that we are preparing our children for the jobs of tomorrow by making sure that they are educated and able to get job training so that they can do those jobs, such as solar panel installation, such as windmills, you know, whatever those huge opportunities are, we need to make sure that our children are prepared for that. So additionally, I think we need to make sure that we are protecting our environment, that we are really investing in making sure that we have clean air, clean water. And again, that comes back to the budget. What do we want to invest in for the common good and make sure that every single American has an opportunity to succeed with making sure we have clean water, clean air, Mr. Kalagi has two minutes. Um, I just got done talking about all the different taxes that I have to pay that's taken all my income and now we're going to have a carbon tax too, just, just what I needed. Um, clean energy is tough because there is no such thing. Um, that No matter what you do, if you, if you take it out of one spot, you're going to take it from somewhere else. There's, there's no free energy. So if you want to go to solar panels, then you have to mine the materials, you have to make those solar panels, you have to ship those solar panels, and then it can't generate baseload. So, and the pollution that you make creating those solar panels cancels out any gains that you get from the electricity that's generated by them. So as long as we have people using energy, we're going to have energy that pollutes. The fortunate thing that we have in this country is that we have clean air already we have clean water already. So we, we, we kind of already took care of that. You know, if you go to Mexico, what do they tell you you have to do? You got to drink bottled water because our water isn't clean. We don't have to do that here. We have clean water. So if you go to China, and I've been there a couple times, you don't wear a mask because there's a pandemic. You wear a mask because the air is horrible. We don't have to do that here. We can see blue skies. Most of the regulations that got repealed were regulations that had never taken effect in the first place. They were done with a flurry of them at the end of the Obama administration. Trump went ahead and repealed them all because none of them were done by the legislature, by the, by the Congress. They were all done by executive order. And they were orders that never had a chance to be implemented. So when they were repealed, it didn't change anything from what we had before. So that's my policy on that. I would love to see cleaner energy. The best thing we can do is conserve energy, use less. So walk more drive less. So that's about the best you can do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Womack, two minutes. Well, we all want clean air. We all want clean water. And the great thing about representing the third district of Arkansas, we have it in abundance. As Mike said, you know, you don't have to drink bottled water. You can get it right out of the tap and it's pretty good, pretty good water uh, with very few exceptions. And the air we breathe in the beautiful Northwest Arkansas area uh, is unlike anywhere really in our country, save for maybe a, a few of the mountainous places. Uh, look, I believe in an all of the above energy approach. I do believe that the ability for this country to transition from fossils to a more greener energy platform is available, but it should not be done in such a way that we just hit the switch and we just, as California has done, and basically put a date on the wall and say, you're not going to be able to have uh, combustion engine cars uh, driving down the streets of California. I, I just think that we've got to be very careful as we make this transition, one, not to uh, commit a lot of federal resources to prop it up because that is making the market. And I don't think the federal government ought to be in the business of making the market. And whatever we do, we have to make sure uh, that we can supply the 
reliable energy sources that can power the grid so that we can keep our e economy going. And I don't think solar or, or wind energy by itself is going to be able to deliver that for us. So, uh, and then lastly, let me just say this, there's been a lot of talk about the Green New Deal. Uh, and a lot of my colleagues on the left have signed on to the Green New Deal. In fact, we have a candidate running for president right now that's signed on to the Green New Deal. If that's the answer uh, for the energy challenges and the clean water and clean air challenges facing our country today, then it's a very bad uh, solution that, that's being offered up. I believe in market-based solutions. Let the private sector do what it does best. That's innovate and create opportunities uh, that lead us to better outcomes. Ms. Williams, one minute rebuttal. I would also like to add that I think that there seems to have been a move to withdraw from leadership by our country recently. And I would like to see us rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. America has always been a leader. And it is with our leadership that we innovate, that we come to better solutions. And I think that we're missing an opportunity. Whenever we step back, then other people are waiting to fill that power vacuum. And so if we want to let China and Russia lead, then we should step back and do nothing. But I don't think that that's who we want being our global leader right now. We need to be leading because I don't think that either China or Russia have the United States' best interest and heart. Thank you, Ms. Williams. But we go immediately back to Ms. Williams for a closing statement. We've reached that point in, uh, in our broadcast. Ms. Williams, you have two minutes. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to not only our panel, but most importantly, those at home who are trying to make their decision on how to vote. I think that what we need right now is someone who understands the struggles of everyday Arkansans. I think that if we want our problems solved, then no one is coming here to save us. I think that no one pay, cares about Arkansas like Arkansans. And if we want to do better, then we need to elect a different person. Congressman Womack has had his chance. He has spent 10 years in Congress. And certainly one thing that we haven't gotten to talk about is health care. And as a family nurse practitioner, I have spent my life serving those in my community, making sure that they get the care that they need when they need it. And one of the big reasons I got involved is because I wanted to make sure that nobody would go broke just because they get sick and that we address the high cost of prescription drug coverage. And certainly, Congressman Womack has been in Congress for 10 years, and if he wanted to solve that problem, then he could have. His only bill he's put forth has been on a commemorative coin. And I think we have to have someone who will work for every single member of the 3rd Congressional District. We've certainly heard some rhetoric about the Green New Deal and liberal left agenda, and I haven't heard those words spoken of from anyone here, only Congressman Womack. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the real problems people are facing. Thank you. Ms. Williams, thank you. Mr. Womack, two minutes for our close. Thank you once again to the panelists. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And to Arkansas PBS, thank you uh, as well. We've had a discussion tonight on a number of topics that have relevance to the election of 2020. All very important uh, issues, you know, climate change and, and what to do about energy and COVID response. And we haven't had a, a lot of chance to talk about national security and some other hot button issues, but deficit and debt certainly has been in play here tonight. But I wanna finish in the last 90 seconds of my time to talk about something that nobody else is talking about here tonight. And that's how important it is that the member of Congress representing the 3rd District of Arkansas know and understand the district. And I would argue of the panelists here today, of, of, of the contestants here today, that I have the most intimate and unique knowledge of the issues affecting my constituents. From the consent decree that is affecting 
the citizens of Fort Smith, Arkansas, that have forced sewer rates to go up 167 percent to dredging to a 12-foot depth, the MCARDs, the, uh, the river navigation system, so that we can bring more commerce up the river. The development of a potential new force structure at Ebbing Airfield at Fort Smith to bring jobs and Air Force infrastructure uh, to Fort Smith, Arkansas. The flooding that happened a little over a year ago down there where I personally went down and helped sandbag so that we could bring relief to the, the people of the second largest city of our state. In Northwest Arkansas, issues regarding I-49 and 412, trying to get infrastructure in place so that we can move people around our area. The VA pathologist and the issues that, that he created uh, for a lot of our veterans at the Fayetteville Veterans Affairs Office. The more recent announcement of the infrastructure that's going in in the northeast part of my district for the telephone companies that are bringing broadband to dozens and dozens of families in rural Arkansas. These are the things that are important to everyday Arkansans that don't show up on the national radar. I think I'm the best person qualified to continue to carry these missions forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Womack. Uh, Mr. Clogg, yes, you're close. Well, well, like I said, you already stole my thunder for my closing remarks, so I'm just going to have to wing it. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised with some of the things that Congressman Womack has said about knowing his district. It's, it's good that he helped sandbag. I've done that, too. Uh, I volunteer about 100 calls every year with the fire department, helping the people in the district as well. He talked about VA issues, and, uh, and I'd like to see him take an actual interest in those because I was one of those veterans that was treated by that pathologist in the VA hospital where, uh, where, little, was done, where little was done about it. So, and the issues at the VA are far greater than that. In fact, I would challenge him. When Obamacare passed, it took away my health care. It made private health care so expensive I could no longer afford it. And so the only thing I had left was my VA health care. And let me tell you that I, I feel bad for all those veterans that are stuck with just that as their health care. Government rationing of health care does not work very well. And that's something that Mr. Womack has been in office for 10 years, and he hasn't done anything to make it any better. There's been lip service, but nothing better. I would challenge you, drop your health insurance. Drop that Cadillac plan they give you for being in Congress. Drop your Medicare. Get all of your health care from the VA then maybe you can understand what's going on in your district and what's going on at the VA. Do what I do, live that life. Make it to where the only medical care you get is what you've inflicted on us with that. So it is time for a change. He's brought up a lot of issues that are important that we need to keep our eye on, but that he hasn't done anything about in the 10 years he's been in office. And it's not like anything's gonna change if we elect Celeste either. It's gonna be more of the same. It's been that way all along. It hasn't mattered whether we elect Democrats or Republicans. We get the same more government, less freedoms, higher taxes. Right now the country is literally burning. People are dying, we're killing each other, divided left and right. The only way to stop that is to take the parties out of power. The only way to do that is to put third parties in power. I want you to be the change that you wanna see in the world. Be libertarian with me. Thank you very much, sir. And that concludes our Arkansas PBS debate in the third congressional district for the district. We thank our three candidates and our panel of journalists as well. Coming tomorrow, the campaign for the U.S. Senate. Arkansas PBS will live stream at 3 o'clock at our YouTube channel, and you can find all our election information at myarkansaspbs.org backslash elections. You can also watch the broadcast at 7 p.m. For now, for all of us at Arkansas PBS, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Major funding for Election 2020 Arkansas PBS Debates provided by AARP Arkansas.